know, it's March, late March. How are our uh, New Year's resolutions going? <laughs> right? Anybody? Did anybody? I can't see anything. Did any? Now I can sort of see something. Anybody keeping a, a resolution they made for New Year's? Okay, right on. I have gained ten pounds since uh, New, since New Year's, um, which would put me squarely in the data for most uh, New Year's resolutions. Uh, about two hundred million people every January first make some big decision, some big gesture that they are seeking to live out, to change their lives, but most people never move beyond that exciting rush of the first few weeks. By February 1st, yes, that is just a mere 31 days later, 130 million, that is 65%, uh, have abandoned their New Year's resolution. And, it, and this happens when the emotional state sort of subsides. And I think that there is a, a spiritual counterpart to this. A third of the people who make resolutions, just that remaining sort of 35%, they make their resolutions, but they keep uh, a diligently moving through that, that critical first six months of practice. And, and if you can sit through that first uh, six months and practice the small motions of that new resolution, there's a chance that it's going to take hold and, and even perpetuate itself. I think, like I said, that there is a spiritual uh, reality behind this that, that is equivalent to this. I operate in a world of something called spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is a term um, often misunderstood. People critique it sometimes rightfully as touchy-feely out of a valid concern that emotions and feelings will be given more weight than logic, reason, and any other form of sort of verifiable or repeatable scholarship. And I would actually join that critique if that is, the, is what I had learned about spiritual formation, but it, it just isn't. For me, what I have come to understand that spiritual formation is, is, is that it is the process by which we grow over time. It's understanding how I move to become that new person. And if there's any clue from the way I keep my resolutions at New Year's, I suspect that it, it isn't making a big decision in one moment that will last me the rest of my life. Spiritual formation is the process by which we grow over time. And what so many spiritual fathers and mothers have said before me is that we grow not by making huge commitments to change, but by making smaller step-by-step -step commitments that form habits that change us over time. Dr. Todd Pickett is my boss. And he is the Dean of Spiritual Development here. And he gives our team direction and he focus us, focuses us uh, by reminding us of our marching orders that what we're doing here at Biola is helping students to understand knowledge of the process of spiritual growth. I, wanted to, I have slides here. Knowledge of the process of spiritual growth. This knowledge of the process is historically something that we know far less about. I think we're really good at knowing what uh, we should be in the end or what our lives should or shouldn't look like it, someday. But what we are more confused about is the process, knowledge of the process of how we would get there. We all know about the destination. And it's because, quite honestly, our spiritual tradition is one that puts a lot of pressure on commitments to make a decision now that will hopefully carry us for a year or more, like a New Year's resolution. But there is a lot of our life telling us that's no way to maintain any kind of decision. Consider what it would be like to apply that logic in other areas of our life. If I could apply that logic to eating, knowing that I am supposed to eat about 2,000 calories a day, couldn't I just eat 20,000 calories in one sitting and then not eat for 10 days? Or even more grotesque, couldn't we figure out how many calories we would need theoretically to eat in a lifetime? sit down at a McDonald's someday and eat 44 million calories and then never eat again. I mean, that's a ridiculous premise, but really it's kind of what we do when it comes to our spiritual commitments. When pressed on this around our spiritual commitments, I think we, we would cave and admit that that's not the best route, that something else is needed. Some measure of orderly follow-up would, would have to take place. That there's a process we need to understand if we are to do and become who we would like to do and become. Who would we like to become? I, I was curious, though, when I was your age, and spiritually speaking, my heritage 
was to have big spiritual commitments really drive me forward toward God. And so for me, I was perpetually in the place where I was waiting for the next big event, and then hopefully I'd kind of get juiced up, and then I'd be able to survive for another little, little bit here, and then I'd get another big event and so forth. And when I would kind of see the holes in that, I would ask my, my sort of spiritual guides, hey, how do, what, what is the process here? Because this is what I'm doing, and inevitably all I would get was, hey, Chad, you need to make an even bigger commitment to keep your big commitment. I think it doesn't encapsulate the complexity necessary. I don't think that commitments are bad. Don't mishear me. Commitments can be good so long as they are the first of many, 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 many steps. It's not the commitment that is the problem. It is the expectation from the commitment that is, we expect more from the commitment than the commitment will ever be able to deliver us. My hope is that you're going to come away from here today feeling a little bit more permission to understand spiritual commitment making inside of a larger context that is a little bit more hospitable to the way that you have been created. Because... I work in the department that does chapel. When Mike and Noreen asked me to speak at chapel this semester, they gave me a couple dates. And I chose this date partially because it was the Monday right after missions conference. I kind of had an idea of where I wanted to go with this talk. And it's likely that there's a lot of resolutions that came out of the excitement uh, regarding having the palpable sense of God's movement here on our campus. Uh, one of our speakers even talked about having a spiritual strategy, which I think is a genius approach. How are we going to do this thing, in other words? Uh, in, in short, many of us likely committed to many things. I, I was in the sessions and I was feeling my own sense of conviction and longing to be a different kind of person. I wanted to speak on the Monday after, not to correct or to critique the act of making big spiritual commitments. But I wanted this date instead of another as a way to support the commitments that were perhaps made. So even just thinking about missions conference, I just want to ask a couple questions just coming out of it. A quick yes or no. Does God's heart break for the nations? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Has God invited us into the big story of what he is doing in the world? Yes. Yeah. So given the fact that you guys know that, what's the problem then? We know it. Why aren't we able to live that out? Returning to Pickett's encouragement to our staff, the problem is not that you don't know the correct answers or you don't know what the end result of your life should look like, but instead, it's that there is very little knowledge of the process of spiritual growth. There's very little knowledge of the process. We're good at knowing the right answers. We're less equipped to understand how we're supposed to get there. Now, as a way of understanding the passage today, I wanted to sort of draw our attention to the process of assembling Legos. My son and I uh, actually usually spend our winter breaks assembling some kind of Lego creation. This last Christmas, we did the Millennium Falcon, which was our magnum opus together. Um, think about the Lego approach for just a second. There is usually a big box with a picture of the end result on the cover of it. In other words, the box is saying, here's where we're headed. This is what you're going to become. Inside the box is bag one, bag two, bag three. I've seen up as high as about 12 bags. And in each bag is open in orderly fashion. And I am kind of the sous chef of the process. So I open a bag and I start itemizing and sort of inventorying the parts. And then Grant, in his side, he begins to go by the step-by-step -step directions of assembling the brick by brick, piece by piece, one snap at a time, one small step after one small step over many, many, many hours. The creation begins to become recognizable. Legos understand something crucial that we often don't. That if we are to create what we see on the cover of the box, we need to engage in about a thousand tiny steps towards that goal. There is no one gigantic step. By contrast, our vision of spiritual growth is equivalent to dumping out a pile of loose Legos in front of you, handing you the box and saying, create what you see on the box, go. Well, I mean, I'm certain that there are people in the world who would be able to do that, but that's not going to be everybody. 
You would get a ton of well-meaning, passionate folks who would jump in with no directions and, and really try and to give it their best shot, and they do. And they try, and they try, and they try, but eventually even the best, most interested and motivated person would give up realizing how pointless it is unless they find and connect to a process. How long would it take you to give up trying to make the Lego design you see on the box without any directions? And the fact that so many give up the faith does not point to an inadequacy of the gospel, but it points to a flaw in the sense of expectation that so many of us create accidentally, trying to make a big commitment that's gonna get us to the finish line. Listen, if you have made a commitment to something, I want to be very clear with you. What, what you need to do is find a small and manageable set of steps. Without this, your commitment will eventually fade. You were not made to make a commitment now that will last you until you get there. You were made to make lots of small, tiny, manageable decisions by the day, sometimes by the hour. And once you get into this mode, I, I really do believe that things will change for you. You'll be more patient with yourself and, and you'll make progress towards the kind of maturity that you have been hoping for. I can sit there with my son, Grant, and, and we can reason to believe that we will, will, are going to engage in a step-by-step -step process that is going to get us towards our goal. And based on the knowledge of what we are becoming together, Grant will have the patience to get through the various stages where the thing he's working on doesn't look anything like the eventual outcome. What we started the process and thinking about this, I, he, he took the first two bricks. It was like step one out of bag one, right? And he takes the two bricks and he snaps them together and trying to just make him laugh, but also trying to just teach him a little bit. I said, let me see that. It's two bricks together. And he goes, that looks nothing like the Millennium Falcon. And he was like, Wait, it doesn't? He, 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 was, he was sort of like, duh. But the point is that he had taken one major step toward the process, and then he put three bricks together, and then four. It took a long time before it looked anything like the Millennium Falcon. And if across the process he loses focus, he has me, and I love him. If he gets discouraged, I can remind him of who we are and what we're doing and where we're headed. And the steps ahead of us are small and manageable. And in this way, I think that, that it's spiritual, but I also think that it's really practical. In other words, getting crystal clear about what maturity looks like for Grant, he's going to be able to endure the various uncomfortable, confusing, chaotic, and challenging stages of being immature as we together, one brick at a time, move closer to our goal. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to... Um, Exodus 16. I wanted to begin kind of going through this just to note really quick. This is, a, of course, the wandering in the desert. So God's people have been enslaved and then God miraculously clearly has freed them from slavery. And so hooray, that's super great and everything. But now they've got a new problem. Uh, where are we going to eat food because we're out here in the desert? And they're, they're reflecting on the fact that we used to have uh, food and water. And now it's a, we're a little bit more insecure about those things. And so th this grumbling kind of begins and starts. And so that is right where the Lord says this. The Lord says to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. There it is. That's the goal on the box. God is trying to teach them to trust him. He said, you, you, you got your food and, and, and water this way, but now you got to come to me for that. He's trying to turn them into the kind of person, cover of the box, he's trying to turn them into the kind of person and group of people who trust him. But God wasn't interested in them making a, a grand commitment to trust him one day and then have that commitment last for all the days. He wanted to train them, and so he instituted a very specific training regimen that we largely don't engage in anymore. Daily, he would provide for them. Daily, they'd have to learn to wait for him. And slowly, they, this would train them to become the kind of people who would have the capacity to trust him like they want to. We're not commitment-making machines. We're routine-creating machines. <laughs> he goes on to say this. Then Moses said to them, 
No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until the morning. But it was full of maggots, and it began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. You see, God put a little self-destruct mechanism inside the manna. And it seems pretty arbitrary, but he could have made the manna last forever if he wanted to, but he wanted to use it as a training. He wanted to steer their hearts away from their tendency to store up because the act of storing up would have taken them away from trusting God in a daily way. And so he trained them with their food. How do we know he was training them? I think the answer is because for one day a week, he relaxed the rules and magically, magically the manna didn't rot away. I think because he was also training them to divide up their week. Listen, listen here. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want and bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath day to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. What God is doing is teaching them as humans that humans are creatures who should think about themselves in daily and then in weekly increments. Your commitments then should be sized appropriately for a day and then for a week. Clearly, this is a hard lesson for us. Secretly, we love to make a commitment now that could carry us until we're much older. But God is reminding us that that's not how he wants us to operate. That is not how we are made. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to the land that was settled. And they ate manna until they reached the border of Cana. What is God trying to teach here? That the thing, this thing is going to take time. This thing is going to take time. And if you're going to keep your commitment, you have to break it down into very small and daily manageable steps. So here, I, wa I want to sort of close this time with some really practical steps for us. Um, the first step, really just sort of a way and a guide through knowledge of the process of spiritual growth. The first step I would mention would be this. I want to resist spiritual hero making. And what do I mean by that? So many forms of spirituality involve elevating one particular really good person. Let's call him or her a spiritual hero. And this hero is identified, and then it becomes the task of the followers to simply copy the spiritual hero. This happens in many faiths, but it also happens in ours. Have you all seen this before? What would Jesus do? Uh, I think this is a, 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 an important question. I think that it has use, and I understand and, and love the heart of the question, what would Jesus do? But I think it is encouraging us simply to copy or to do an impression of Jesus without the heart change and, and allowing that to suffice as if that's what God is after. Dallas Willard was so key in saying that this is not a matter of simply doing what Jesus would do, but instead, it's a, it's a better, longer question. What would Jesus do to become the kind of person who could do the kind of things that Jesus did? <laughs> Which really couldn't be encapsulated as well on a bracelet. That's really more of a belt or a sash, right? And we're probably not going to wear a sash. But it's a better question. What would Jesus do to become the kind of person who could do the kind of things that Jesus ended up doing? That's a better set of questions than what would Jesus do? Okay, well then copy that. No, ask ourselves the question, what were the things that he did? So, second thing. Get comfortable. This thing takes time. Let's buckle up together. We're not going to be there today. Uh, as a chapel speaker this morning, I would love to believe about myself 
that by the time I wrap this thing up, you guys are going to be the promised land, right? Spiritual change will have just occurred because I spoke words, right? Uh, that's probably not going to happen. If it does, somebody let me know. That'd be really cool. Um, it's going to take time. The message of faith as trivia is that if you just realize it, then you should be able to do it. The only problem is that some of this stuff that we know is hard. Take forgiveness. Most of us would agree that it's something that we should do, that we're commanded to do. But the moment you realize and agree that you should forgive is not also the moment when you realize that you are able to forgive. If forgiving that person for what they did to you is the cover of the Legos box, you need to back up from that and evaluate what it would take to become the kind of person who could do the kind of things that would lead to the Lego box cover. And the message of manna is that there is a small measure of work toward forgiveness that I can do today, that I'm responsible for today, that tomorrow I will be responsible to, for tomorrow's work. But today, the Holy Spirit has conceivably given me marching orders toward forgiveness today, and it will be a today-sized commitment. You're going to have to check back in tomorrow for, for that day, because on that day, God will be eager to give you that day's orders God has divided our lives neatly into days, and for each day there is an appropriate measure of work that can be tackled for that day. I, I really believe that the mystery of he doesn't give us more than we can handle is wrapped up in God's daily approach in this way, because we cannot store up our belief. Next one, seek to understand your triggers. Take small steps to avoid them. This person, that group of friends, this activity, listen to me, Viola, there should be some things that you pass on, you say no to, not because God forgid, for, forbids it, but because you know those things are triggers for you. And so for you, you're acknowledging, listen, I understand that that's okay for most people, but for me, it is not. You should know what time of day you are tempted to do the things that you don't want to do. You should understand that things that lead to the acceleration of the behavior that you don't want. Listen, today you are not responsible to make sure you never do that thing ever again. Today that is not what is on your plate. But you are responsible to understand your triggers and to avoid them today. And that is actually way more doable than promising right now that you will never do that thing again. If you are trying to not talk about people as much, then maybe... Try to avoid the people who just when you launch in, they just start talking about people. That's probably a trigger for you. Another one. Recognize that shame and guilt are completely inadequate motivators. In fact, they're actually demotivating over time. Theologically, shame and guilt have no place. Shame and guilt were designed to be simply just an indicator on the dashboard of our hearts telling us that there's something that we need to look at. The first sign that all is not right. But literally, people have over-relied on shame and guilt, and they have tried to go bare knuckles against their sin using only guilt and shame. And I'd say, just as a friend, that's a rough way to go, and it's a sure way to burn out pretty quick. And so, another one. I'd say think small. Think small in your commitments, not big. A small commitment that is about the size of a day's worth of work is exactly what you should be shooting for. And I know that that's kind of the whole talk, but it's still worth saying here in this wrap up. If you want to be able to do 100 push ups, then you should start by doing five today. Maybe you should do five the rest of this week, and then perhaps next week you should do six. And then maybe in, in a week later you do seven or eight and then you start moving that way. That's the way you get yourself to 100 push-ups. The thing that yanks us from the healthy approach is comparison and competition. And oh my goodness, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation one-on-one -on -one with you about how much comparison and, and competition is hurting us and hurting our faith, particularly here at Biola. For this, I'd steer a lot of time into reflecting on how our identities are secure, not in what others think about us, 
but they're secure in Christ primarily because it's there that we'll finally be able to release our grip on that competitive approach that robs us from what God is doing in our hearts. Additionally, I would say this, engage in accountability, but do it in such a way where your goals can be kept small, not big. In other words, I don't think it's useful for you to be held accountable for never ever doing that thing again or never saying that again or never seeing that person again. Those things are probably things that can't, you can't manage. But ask your accountability partners to help you manage and keep your goals that you set and your commitments that they're, they're day-sized commitments. We are relational creatures and relational understanding that sometimes accountability can become anti-relational. How many times have you not wanted to go back to your accountability partner and say, I did it again? And, and eventually, how many times can you do that before you just eventually just kind of give up and start lying? And so this relational accountability thing can quickly accelerate into a place where you now are not even being relational. You're not even being held accountable. So make sure your accountability is, is small, not big. And then finally, the last one is this. Pastoral care, counseling at the BCC, spiritual direction, the, the services here at Biola that are set up for you are so helpful. I would just say this, if you want help trying to figure out what your life is, figure out what your commitments are and what you want to do, uh, you want to come into pastoral care office, you can talk to Chris, talk to myself, talk to the people in our office, we'll help you break your life down so that these big commitments that you want to keep can be kept in small daily increments. We can, we can help with that. You don't have to be alone in that. I think God establishes this pattern and we saw it the first time as he was daily reminding them, do not store up this manna. I will, I will, I will let it rot. You won't be able to do that. So I, I would just encourage us with those seven things as we think, as we leave today, as you are maybe unpacking some things that you wanted to become out of missions conference. Try to hold on to some of those smaller visions of your commitments instead Try to lean into what God is doing and showing us in Exodus 16, not by making the grand gesture, but by seeing that he is pleased as you take effort to make your commitments smaller, not bigger. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.